Hello and welcome to Intelligence Squared. I'm Justin Webb from the Today programme. George Packer is a journalist and author whose words during 15 years as a staff writer for The New Yorker and latterly at The Atlantic have helped to frame American public life. He's no friend of Donald Trump, but his writing is often uncomfortable too for the American left. He's interested, it has always struck me, in the truth more than parading his credentials before admirers. He's the author of 11 books, including The Assassin's Gate, America in Iraq, which analysed the events leading up to the US invasion back in 2003, and The Unwinding, an inner history of the new America, which won the National Book Award for nonfiction in 2013. And those titles conjure up a rather worthy picture, don't they? A distant, almost lofty one that could not be further from the truth. His books come alive with stories. Indeed, the stories are the key, the actual experiences of actual people. His latest book is Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal, now finding its way onto our shelves as a paperback. Note the renewal bit of the title. That's not something you hear so much about at the moment. He joins me now to talk about it. Welcome to Intelligence Squared, George. Very good to be with you, Justin. Can we start with renewal? Um, because the obvious thing to do is talk about all the things that have gone wrong, when we'll certainly get to some of those. If there is hope, where does it come from? First of all, in the fact that Americans threw out Donald Trump, which was not a given. In fact, it almost didn't happen. And when you look around the world at populist authoritarian rulers, there's only one place where the public got rid of him, and that's the United States. It's hard to do. Once they're in, they have a way of staying in. Um, and so the tremendous turnout in the middle of the pandemic in the November 2020 election was a statement of faith, perhaps tattered and skeptical, but still a statement of faith in democracy on the part of the American people. We're incredibly divided, incredibly bitterly uh, opposed to one another. But by 7 million votes, Americans threw out the worst president in our history. And I wrote the book, Last Best Hope, between the election and the inauguration of of Joe Biden, which normally is a kind of lull period in American politics where everyone's waiting for the new administration. In this case, it was practically the road to Fort Sumter uh, in the run-up to the Civil War. So it was a dramatic period, and we survived it. So for me, the chance to renew is more the issue than any real renewal, because we're still stuck in the same... Um, really destructive cycle that we were in throughout the Trump years, but we've given ourselves the chance to get out of it. If there is going to be a renewal, how then? What are the first steps towards it? I see two different but related um, chronic problems. One is inequality, which grows and grows every year and divides us by class, by region, by race, and I think that inequality, which is really a long story, and it's true here, it's true throughout Europe, it's the story of the post-industrial era of globalization and of mass immigration, which has created tremendous strains on the body politic. That inequality cuts against a basic American assumption, not that everyone will have the same outcomes, because we've never believed in that. Um, that's never been on the table for Americans. And so we have a thin social welfare state compared to Europe. But at least the chance to rise, the chance to improve oneself and one's family, and not to be stuck for one's whole life and family's life in one place because of birth. And that is no longer true. We are stuck. We have become almost an aristocracy. Uh, in which there's a business class and a professional class at the top that keeps securing its own benefits, its own place, and making sure the children hold that place, and a falling middle and working class that have less and less chance to And just rise. to be clear about it, because it's a fascinating subject, that it's not the top 1%, is it, that people all, all always talk about. It's, it's a much bigger group of people who've, who've stolen everything, as it were, if I could put it like that. I'm in that group. I'm a journalist. I work for, I've worked for The New Yorker, now for The Atlantic. These are great journalistic jobs. And I'm going to try to make sure my kids get good educations and have a chance to do what they want in life and, and prosper. And we could call it the top 10%. It's people with education, more than with certainly 
not based on simply on inherited wealth. Um, it is education that has created a kind of aristocracy of the educated who know that there are certain things you have to do, certain people you have to know, certain ways you have to behave in order to stay in that class. So it is truly an upper class, a mass upper class of maybe the top 10%. And below that, there are different levels, but they're harder and harder to escape. There's less fluidity. There's less social mobility in the United States now than in most European countries, which was not true when I was a child. Our social mobility was our, uh, our promise. It's why people come to the United States. And it's why our capitalism is rougher than Europe's, because we think, OK, it's going to be hard and there's a long way to fall, but you can also rise more easily. And now that's no longer true. So that is one side of our political ills, this inequality that's hardened into a class system uh, that gives Americans a sense that they no longer have a place at the table as equals, as people who can look each other in the eyes equals and say we're all just as good as each other, which has been an aspiration, not a reality, but an aspiration of Americans ever since Tocqueville, who said it's equality of conditions that is the most striking thing about the United States. Yeah. And the challenging thing for the Democrats in that is it's not just the rich and the Republican voting rich who you're talking about. It is actually also Democrats, including members, frankly, of recent Democratic administrations who go, you know, after the administration goes, go off to the West Coast, work for a, 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 a tech company, etc., go back to an administration. Some have come back to the Biden administration now. It's, it's a more complex picture, isn't it, politically? It is. I mean... It Historically, the Republican Party represented the business class and, let's say, the spirit of getting ahead. The Democrats represented the average guy, uh, the spirit of the fair shake. And that held as sort of the division of the two parties for most of the 20th century. But since the end of the Industrial Age, the Democrats have become the party of professionals more and more, combined with non-whites and other minority groups, although those are in play. They're certainly not uh, the, the property of the Democratic Party. And to the shock of a lot of Democrats, Latino voters moved over toward Trump in 2020 after four years of his presidency. And it, it's worth trying to understand why that happened rather than assuming that the Democrats are the party of inclusion and the Republicans are the party of white males, as some Democrats think. So, and the Republican Party has gone from being that party of business, of um, in some ways middle American business, small town business, as well as corporate America, to the party of essentially an angry uh, white working class that has fallen further behind and has seen its place as sort of the backbone of the country, you know, the, the, the bedrock of, a, of American democracy and capitalism. In, instead, they're... Lives look more and more like the lives of uh, people in the cities who suffer from drug addiction, um, fatherless families, multi-generational poverty. You see that in all kinds of towns and uh, rural areas outside the big metropolitan centers. So the Democrats have the big cities, which have become more and more prosperous and better educated. And the Republicans have the towns and countryside, which have in many areas um, been sort of abandoned. And so that's where populism of the Trump variety has come from. It also damages, doesn't it, the kind of constitutional setup that America is, because you, you have this um, superabundance of, of power or, or, or imbalance of power in the way America was set up in order that rural parts of America would have a, a, a proper say which sort of worked, didn't it, when it was Republicans and Democrats who were competing for power in those rural areas. But now if you have that ossification on party lines that you're talking about, it makes it, it, it really does strike at the kind of fundamentals of the Constitution. I'm thinking of, you know, how the Senate is set up with two, two senators from even tiniest states, et cetera, et cetera. All those things somehow are, are in play, aren't they? They are. I mean, our our system is founded on a series of compromises, essentially, which were about slavery and allowing slavery to continue uh, after the, uh, the formation of the republic. And that system empowers small states. Uh, it empowers rural areas. Um, it 
uh, creates an electoral college, which is fundamentally undemocratic because you can win the popular majority and still lose the election, as we see over and over again. Yes, famously recently. Famously. Um, and it could be a, our future, too. Um, but when I was young, there was a Democratic senator from South Dakota. His name was George McGovern. He was the most liberal member of the Senate. Yeah. There were Democrats from Iowa. I'd forgotten uh, that he from, came from South Dakota. Yes, that is an extraordinary fact. There was a, a Democrat from Idaho named Frank Church, very liberal. And these were also really great senators. So the red-blue divide, which really became entrenched starting around the year 2000, has favored Republicans because the anti-democratic structure of our government with the Senate, the Electoral College, and other things too, gerrymandering of political districts, uh, has played into the Republican hands so that they can hold on to power with a minority vote. And that's become the cause of a lot of bitterness among Democrats who want to change the institutions. I don't think they are going to be changed. And also to the public who sense that their vote actually doesn't matter. So why, if there's an electoral college that's going to overrule the majority, why should I vote? But I wanted to say, Justin, the other thing that's gone wrong is simply our ability to govern ourselves, to solve problems together. And I think that's related to inequality in the sense that, although I don't want to romanticize the past in any way because it gave us slavery, segregation, and all kinds of wrongs, it, the elites at least felt some obligation to deal with each other in the interest of the public, maybe their own public, but in the interest of the public. And now more and more, our leaders are, are um, <clears throat> seem to have no sense that they have an obligation to solve problems. Instead, they are rewarded by the voters, not for solving problems, but for pandering, for parading on Twitter and on cable news, for making a name and a brand for themselves. They're more in it for themselves than to represent the public. And it's not only true of the elites. Ordinary Americans simply can't have these conversations that are essential to solving problems. You don't govern a democracy by pure force of numbers. You also have to bring people along or else eventually you're going to run into a backlash. And today we no longer know how to do that. Instead, uh, each side sees the other as a mortal adversary that has to be destroyed. Uh, and Trump brought us a long way toward that by behaving that way, by being the first president to make no pretense of governing the entire country and representing all Americans. Well, I've got an easy solution to that. Just get off social media. Everyone. Amen. I'm not on it, Justin. <laughs> but it, Are you not? I'm not. <laughs> I avoided it uh, all my all right. career. And, and, you know, I've paid a bit of a price because I'm sort of a non-entity as far as social media goes. But it is poison. It corrodes the veins of our discourse. It, it seems to... Uh, to privilege contempt. Contempt is the language of social media, and contempt to me is antithetical to democracy, in which, for me, de democracy means you have to have a minimal respect for your fellow citizens in order for this to work. Otherwise, you're going to end up where we are, which is unable to solve problems from COVID to global warming to inequality, uh, et cetera. So among the many problems that need to be faced up to, is is that one of them? And of course there is. I mean, actually, to, to an extent, a bipartisan effort, isn't there, to, to look particularly at Facebook, um, but, but also a, at other social media places as well, and say we've got to do something about this, uh, and actually, t to an extent, I suppose it's it's worldwide. I think was it David Rhodes who said Facebook was the biggest threat to freedom and democracy around the world. David Rhodes used to work for for Barack Obama. Anyway, there is this kind of sense, isn't there, that something needs to be done. So when you're when we we started with renewal and the things that need to be done, is that also one of the things that needs to happen? Is a, is a, I'm not sure we're going to get to what the solution might be, but actually a thoroughgoing conversation about who's in charge when it comes to social media. I think so. I mean, of course, like everything else, the debate over social media quickly devolves mm -hmm into a, well, you're for hatred, well, you're for censorship. When you put it that way, there's no debate to be had. 
you can't debate someone who's for hatred. You can't debate someone who wants to censor you. And unfortunately, that is the default of our of our discourse to go to those extremes. But I think this is an issue where Democrats and Republicans might find some common ground because there is an antipathy toward big tech on both sides. But there's also so much money coming from big tech. Uh, and that's uh, another deep problem in our inability to govern ourselves is the, the absolute rule of, of big money in Washington. Um, that I don't know if if they'll ever get it done, but there's some obvious regulations that could be looked at. Have the algorithms made public? Uh, have the algorithms uh, be unable to target advertising in certain ways? Um, just in basic things that could be done that don't suppress speech, but that force the the tech corporations to stop uh, poisoning the well in a way that makes us hate each other quite so much. We'll still hate each other, but it doesn't have to be <laughs> so bad that it's easy enough for Putin to put a few drops more into the well for everything to go bad, which is what's happened. Tell us about the divisions in American society that you've identified for your book, because they're fascinating. I know they're not hard and fast. Uh, there are some who might drift from one into another, but you've come up with this 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 kind of um, groupings of Americans that is genuinely helpful. Go, go through it. Yeah, it's sort of a, a, a zoology of American types um, and of narratives, really, more than in individual types, it's it's of ideas of what kind of country we should be. I call them free America, smart America, real America, and just America. And they are, in a way, there's a chronology here. Free America was the Reagan era, and here it was Thatcher. It was the idea that government should get out of the way, that there is no such thing as society, they're only individuals, that lower taxes and deregulation will create both freedom and prosperity. And that has had a stronghold on the business class and the Republican Party for decades. Up till now, you'll still hear the same mantra of tax cuts if you listen in, to, God help you, to a, a Senate speech today, as, as if the same record has been playing over and over again. Smart America is the narrative of the professional class, uh, the Clintons, Barack Obama. It's that if you go to college and enter one of the post-industrial professions and don't get stuck in one of these dying fields of, of farming or industry, you will, uh, you will prosper. You will be part of the global world. You'll be a cosmopolitan. And that became the base of the Democratic Party in the 90s, as I was saying earlier. Those are two, I would call them elite narratives, business, professional. They dominated our politics from about 1980 to about 2008. And then we had two rebellions from below. The first I call real America, a phrase Sarah Palin, do you remember her? I certainly do. <laughs> She's uh, perhaps underestimated as an important figure because I think she was the John the Baptist for Donald Trump. She came in in 2008 and began talking about real America and real Americans. And by that, she meant white Christian heartland America. And she called it these towns where people grow our food and teach our children and fight our wars and... These are the real Americans. And she, she didn't say white Americans, but that, that's who came to her rallies. That's who f flocked to her. And it was the beginning of right-wing populism, of a sense that the people who the country really belongs to had been pushed out, and they need to grab it back from those elites above them, those contemptuous elites who despise them, and from those undeserving, darker people below them, immigrants, black people, brown people. Real America... Uh, sees the Republican Party from the Tea Party to Trump, and it still really has control over the party from the base. It's the, the mass of Republicans who will not let go of Trump as their tribune, their hero. So as much as the elites of the Republican Party, Mitch McConnell, would love to be rid of it and get back to tax cuts and uh, deregulation, those uh, populists, real Americans, uh, are truly the energy of the party. And they're they're more like a European um, 
group, more like a European idea of politics than we've ever had in our country, because they still want a welfare state. They don't want to get rid of their Social Security and, <clears throat> and their Medicare. They just don't think it should go to those people. It should go to us because we paid for it. We deserve it. So when you hear Marine Le Pen talking about this mix of getting rid of immigrants but keeping Social Security, that's very much what real America is about and what Trump is about. The fourth group is also a rebellion. It's a generational rebellion. I call it just America. And that's in the crude parlance of the day. It's woke America. It's the idea that we are a permanently unjust country with a hierarchy of oppression from white straight men that you are defined by your group, your racial group, your sexual identity, gender, et cetera. And that this has never really changed. No matter what tinkering we've done with laws and with habits and customs, it's never really changed. And there's something fundamentally malign about America. The system doesn't work for those people, and it will never work for them as it is, so it has to be gotten rid of. And so you can see that as we get closer to real and just America as the, the energy of our politics, there's just less and less debate to be had and more and more existential battle to be fought. And that's where we've gotten in the last few years. Uh, and that brings us then, well, we, we could do both of the kind of parties and how they deal with that. Let's start with the Republicans. What what then, in, in that battle between uh, that, that elite and those people who've given such energy to, to Trump and to Trumpism, where does the balance lie at the moment? I think there is a a kind of a fight going on but it's a shadow fight between those two groups, the elites and the populace. The elites still have a lot of power, especially in Congress. And um, while Trump was president, very little happened except one big tax cut, which would have been fine with every Republican administration from Ronald Reagan to Donald Trump. In other words, something fundamental didn't change much. There was a lot of rhetoric it's a lot of turmoil and ugliness, but Trump didn't, he made some changes on trade policy and immigration policy, but they didn't fundamentally change the country. So in a way, the populace have not won, but the elites know that they are up against the future because every time the elites try to stand up to Trump, they back down within days or weeks, there was just a story in the New York Times today about Kevin McCarthy, the House Republican leader, and Mitch McConnell, the Senate Republican leader, thundering that we must get rid of him after the January 6th insurrection. And within days, they were both finding that they couldn't uh, muster the, the courage to do it. Why? Because their fellow Republicans were telling them, Trump is a hero in my district. You go up against him, I'm dead. You're dead. It's political finale. So basically, they've allowed this beast to take over their party and they can't stop it. So I think that's, in a way, we still see skirmishes, but the fundamental thrust of the Republican Party is in that direction of authoritarian populism. But can you do it without the authoritarianism? In other words, it, it, could you potentially have Trumpism without Trump and in a way that actually did some of the things that he promised to do before the election, like addressing prescription drug prices, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, proper, properly populist things, biffing the, the pharmaceutical companies and all that kind of stuff, but without the kind of edge of racism and all, all the rest of it. Is, is, is that a potential outcome or is that, is that um, uh, overly, overly optimistic, as it were? I mean, in theory, it could happen. Um, in theory, there's nothing inherently authoritarian about even changing our immigration policy to allow far fewer immigrants into the country. You could do that in a democratic way. But Trump and his followers don't seem able to because... I think they're drawing on emotions that are not policy, defined by policy. They're defined by 
a sense of resentment and, and anger and fear of the future, which are more powerful than any uh, prescription drug policy. And that's where the energy comes from. And I think that leads to authoritarianism because it means you have to essentially draw a line around who's an American and who isn't, who's one of us and who's not. And as soon as you've done that, you've begun to uh, to erode both the, the, the consent of the government, the idea that the majority should rule, and the institutions mm. through which they rule, which the Republican Party used to stand up for and now routinely trashes, whether it's the courts, the CIA and FBI, uh, the media, um, the Congress itself, which now seems the Republicans there seem pretty much okay with having been as assaulted by a mob that tried to kill them. That's an incredible thing. They're okay with that now. Mm-hmm. And that shows how deep authoritarianism has seeped into the, into the bones of the party. Do you think Trump will be the candidate in 2024? It's very hard to predict American politics. Um, Trump could keel over and die. <laughs> but I think if he doesn't keel over and die, he probably will be because it's a personality cult. <clears throat> uh, so that brings us to the Democrats uh, and, and what their, not only what their response is to that, but also going back to your gr- groupings, the smart ones uh, at the top, the woke ones at the bottom and the conflict between them. Uh, do, do you see uh, a Democratic Party never mind the personnel at the top, et cetera, but a Democratic Party that can reach some kind of uh, arrangement or set of arrangements between those two groups that allows it to be a continuing force in American politics, or is it pulling itself apart? Right now it is pulling itself apart. And the inability of the Biden administration to pass most of its legislative agenda, in spite of having very thin majorities, very thin, but majorities in Congress, um, shows how destructive the divisions have become and how little trust there is um, between, it's generational. I mean, Justin, you you probably feel this here too, but this is a generational clash between mm. parents and children almost. And it's a, it's not just in politics, it's in journalism, it's in the arts, it's in philanthropy. There is a deep division about what this country, our country, America, is and what um, its value is between the generations. So on the Democratic side, I my book laid out a kind of agenda that I thought was the best chance for Democrats to do two things. One, to reverse the inequality that's been corroding us for decades. And second, to allow us to sh- to govern, to uh, to allow uh, government to show the ordinary American that it can do things to help their yeah. lives, and that was Biden's agenda. He went in with a jobs plan, a, a social welfare plan, an infrastructure plan to rebuild roads, bridges, etc., um, <clears throat> and it. It has not really succeeded because of the divisions in the Democratic Party, because of the utter 100 percent opposition of the Republican Party, except to the infrastructure bill. And so I think there was when I finished the book in January 2021, I thought this is the path. It's a kind of social democratic path toward more government, but more government, not to make people's lives more difficult with regulations, but to bring up that bottom 60%, let's say, and to limit the power of the top 10% so that Americans feel as if, in a way, they all have a fair chance. That's the key for everyone to feel they have a fair chance. That was Biden's agenda. And for me, that was the best chance for us to get out of the poisonous uh, atmosphere that we're in today. So you're talking there about policies. And I want to bring you then with the Democrats onto what you identified as being, in a sense, more important is the kind of emotional connection when we were talking about the Republicans and the emotional connection that seems to have been lost between a lot of Democrats and and 
the, the, the nation, actually sort of basic patriotism, which you associate so much with, with Americans. And I, there's one, I can't remember the exact phrase, but you describe, when you're describing smart Americans, you say they're interested in heirloom tomatoes and self-driving cars, I think is your, is your it's a fantastic phrase, but not in pa- patriotism, not, 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 not in kind of that sort of sense of allegiance to the, to the nation. Yeah, it makes them uncomfortable. It makes them feel as if it's sort of a retrograde return to some older... <laughs> Thing and That's right. You say like dog racing. Cigarette <laughs> smoke and dog racing. Yeah, where they're just things that we've gotten beyond. We're better than that now. We're citizens of the world. We're cosmopolitans. The era of globalization has made a lot of people in New York feel closer to people in London than to people 30 miles outside New York City. And that is uh, maybe an inevitable trend in, in a global era, but it's also quite harmful to the ability of the country to do things because I don't think you can solve big problems without patriotism, without a sense that this country is worth improving and is ours. And in a sense, we have an allegiance to it like the, the allegiance we have to our own family, that this is, we don't think it's necessarily better than everyone else's or that we should hurt other families, but this is the family we care most about and that we will put our energy into and defend. And there's so many people on the left especially, but more and more on the right as well, who have a kind of easy uh, dismissal of those things. They they find them, you know, the, the statements of American values to be, uh, they, they roll their eyes because they don't think they're true anymore if they ever were. And I think once you lose that sense of um, there is something here that we have to fight for and defend and that we and that we owe to each other even if we don't agree even if we hate each other we're stuck with each other we're we're quarantined with each other (laughs) so we have to find a way to see each other as brothers and sisters which is highly idealistic i realize but i think there has to be some of that and there, there there is less and less and it means we do not solve our problems. And when you come to the the, the, the kind of bottom group, the, the increasingly powerful group on the left-hand side of your your sort of zoological um, description of, of America, so the, the just America people, they genuinely don't believe, it seems to me, that America is is the decent place that certainly their parents would have believed it, it was or, or could be. Well, the, the best version of that is that we are facing our history more honestly now than we ever have. And that is something deeply necessary. The George Floyd protests forced that out into the open. It's been coming for years. It's not as though it began with George Floyd. I think it's been coming since about 2014. You can see a lot of markers. What books were the bestsellers and the prize winners? How did teachers talk in the classroom? But since George Floyd, there has been a really passionate desire to look at the history of this country and to see how the present has been shaped by it, especially the racial history. That's necessary. What is not necessary, in fact, I think is destructive, is to frame it in such categorical, almost metaphysical terms that we are trapped in our identities and in our history and nothing can change and there is no variety within an individual And there's no uh, fluidity within our society where people can mix, they can rise, they can move. Instead, we're trapped in these monolithic blocks of identity. I think it's a false picture of our society, and I think it's, it's an illiberal one. It actually leads toward a different kind of authoritarianism, an authoritarianism based on, on oppression and identity. It's interesting on, on race, isn't it? Because, and we're, we're, we're too white guys in later middle age, I think it's fair to say. Absolutely fair. But I mean, you know, you look back at what happened to race and the idea that actually, the kind of Martin Luther King idea that you judge people on their characters and that in the end you're aiming for a society where skin colour not only doesn't matter, but but you don't even see it. Uh, and that race is a is a construct itself, is not true. It's It's a kind of... You know, I, I remember growing up being being taught, and it was an interesting to hear that there isn't 
anything really that separates us as, as human beings. That race just just is is a, is well, it is it is it is a, a an idea that is foisted on us. And yet now, in the United States, it's had this kind of complete refresh in in a way that um, it feels as if we don't quite know where that ends. It's become an essence which it never was and never should be. We should always be striving for it to disappear. Uh, my solution for our racial problems is just intermarriage as far as the eye can see. But what's happened ideologically in the last few years, and this is an orthodoxy really of professional people on the left. This, is, this doesn't run deep throughout the country. This is in the cities, it's in the metropolitan areas, uh, it's, it's in the universities, the media organizations, but it's really powerful because they have a lot of cultural power and it's an orthodoxy that really says, this is your essence, you can't change it, it's the most important thing about you and it kind of tells me what I need to know about you and it also limits you, what you can say, um, what you can write and I think it's a tremendous amount of resistance to that is building, and the Republican Party is exploiting it by passing these laws that are banning certain types of speech, uh, their own form of censorship, and it just speeds up and worsens this cycle of culture wars. But it is coming from the, the left, too, in quite a big way. And I think what the left misses is that most Americans don't want to live and think this way. So in my city, New York, we've elected a mayor, Eric Adams, who's a former cop, black, uh, working class from the outer borough. You can hear it as soon as he starts talking. Uh, and he won in one of the most liberal cities in the country by saying, I'm not going to defund the police. I'm going to make sure that the police respect the citizenry and I'm going to punish police officers who violate your rights. But we need more police. We need them in the subways. Crime is rising. He said, I'm not going to get rid of gifted and talented programs in the schools simply because there's an imbalance of white and black in those programs. I'm going to try to make them better. I'm going to create more of them, but I'm not going to get rid of them because I want to reward students who do well and who aspire. And so these seem so basic, but he made a lot of enemies on the left in this way. And he was elected by New Yorkers because most of the voters in New York are non-white working class people. And that gets back to what I think is Biden's agenda as well. And I think Biden and Adams have a real allegiance. They're trying to get the Democratic Party away from nonstop cultural battle and back towards something it used to do very well, which was to speak to ordinary people and to say, we're the party that cares about you and that will improve your lives. But there's all kinds of ways in which this is not happening or happening very slowly. Yeah. I mean, do you think it can happen in time for the next election? I mean, where I'm assuming that Biden himself doesn't stand. It's very hard. I mean, the best year for a president to get something done is his first year. After that, people are already looking at the next election. His power is sort of ebbing. Um, I think that the Democrats are probably going to get creamed uh, in the midterms this November, and Biden will likely no longer have a majority in at least one of the two houses of Congress, which will then make it almost impossible to pass any big bills. Um, they've made a terrible, terrible mistake in allowing their inner divisions to keep them from passing their own legislation. They should have found a way to compromise. And instead, the public looks and says, what have you done? We don't know what you've done. They have done things, but they haven't explained them because they've been too busy fighting each other. So I'm afraid the Republicans will be the beneficiaries of that. In a normal politics, that would be the ordinary oscillation of power. Yeah. But now we have a, a Republican Party that is a threat to our democracy, a direct threat to our democracy. And so, so much rides on these elections. And yet I am afraid they're going in the direction that could lead to, to a restoration of that kind of authoritarian populism. And when it comes to two years later, then, is Kamala Harris in any way, shape or form, do you think, the, the, the future hope of the party? I don't think so. I don't think so. She's She appears not to know what she stands for. She moves from one thing to another. She seems um, opportunistic and has has not 
been impressive as a vice president. She has not shown that she knows how to speak to the whole country and to get things done as a vice president can in a narrow way, but get things done and show this was my project and it's done and here's how it benefits you. So I think that she, the Democrats would be fools to treat her, if Biden decides not to run again, to treat her as the heir apparent because I think they're could be stronger candidates. But her people are going to say, number one, she has the right to be the heir apparent because she's vice president. Number two, she's a woman and she's a woman of color. And my goodness, yeah. that puts the party in a difficult position. It does indeed. You've described it perfectly. As for being a vice president, that that's not an, an automatic in our politics. You could say George H.W. Bush ran in 1988 as the vice president. There was a lot of contention in the Republican Party for that spot. It's not handed off so simply. Although in this case, if Biden, in a sense, abdicates after one term, it seems a little more as if it should be hers. But it's the woman and black woman that really makes it hard to to take her on. But I, as I said, I think the Democrats would be crazy to assume that she has to be the, the party leader because I think she would be a weak one. Uh, and going back to the Republicans and Trump, who, you know, you, you think could well be, assuming other things don't happen, could well be their candidate. Um, is there anyone, do you think, who has the the potential power to block him? No, there's no one. Anyone who begins to clear his or her throat and say, I think we've made a mistake in aligning ourselves so completely with a terrible man and a terrible leader, it, it disappears uh, from the party within days. Uh, Liz Cheney, for example, the congresswoman from Wyoming, who's shown great courage in taking on Trump ever since January 6th and onward and never backing down. And she's now one of only two Republicans on the House committee investigating the insurrection. She will probably be defeated in the primary in Wyoming this spring. Um, there's almost no one left. They've been, they have all fallen or more likely fallen silent ah. because they're afraid and power is uh, worth more than their honor. Can, and so they're going to, to have Trump. Can I suggest one? Uh, Please. In, in <laughs> Nikki Haley, who was Trump's uh, UN ambassador. She's a considerable woman, considerable politician in her own right. She was the first female governor of South Carolina, um, a very able woman, a real cold warrior, as, as you know well, um, certainly no friend of the Russians or the Chinese, um, managed to leave office with Trump, is it fair to say, without necessarily completely upsetting him and she's trodden a difficult line since then. I, I just wonder whether the because of Ukraine, which we haven't really talked about yet, but I wonder if one of the impacts on American politics of Ukraine might be that that kind of muscularity that she would demonstrate, allied with a sort of understanding of the Trump people, might 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 be attractive. Yeah, that's a very good question, and we should talk about Ukraine because I think it is changing American politics in a subtle way, and it's not clear if it's going to last, but it, the Ukrainian position in the war is immensely popular in the United States, and it's nearly unanimous support uh, in Congress with about eight lunatic far-right Trumpists voting against suspending trade relations and declaring Putin a war criminal, etc., and maybe five Democrats who um, think that we're hypocrites because we're not doing the same with the Palestinians. Other than that, all of Congress is supporting the Biden policy of, while well, keeping American troops out, pouring weapons and other aid into Ukraine and rhetorically uh, ratcheting up the pressure on uh, Putin and with sanctions. So. The Republicans complain he's not doing enough. The Democrats are actually, even very left-wing Democrats, are urging him to do more. It's kind of remarkable mm -hmm. because until Ukraine, our 
the, the drift of American foreign policy was toward isolationism. The d disastrous withdrawal from Afghanistan seemed to be the end of an era of intervention. And the vast majority of Americans were sort of thinking, that's it, we're done. N no more of these involvements. We can't win them. Let's just focus on ourselves. And suddenly, six months later, there's Ukraine. On the Republican side, it really does put pressure on anyone who wants to say, what good is NATO? Um, I admire Putin. He's strong. He's a Christian. He's anti-gay. These were all the things that Republicans were saying while Trump was president. They're very hard to say right now. And it might make it harder for the Trumpist element in the party to really permanently change America's role in the world. But I'm afraid a distant war, even one as important as this, is not going to change the fundamental dynamics of the Republican Party, which is if you begin to be a threat to Trump, Trump will turn on you and his people will turn on you. If Nikki Haley begins to seem like a contender, an opponent, Trump will begin to ridicule and denounce her and it will be very hard for her to retain support among more than the kind of people who want to get rid of Trump but don't want to say so. He's popular. He has the party base. He, he will continue to have it. And that is the fundamental problem for anyone who wants to move the Republican Party in a sane and healthy direction. On that note, we have to leave it. George, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder, George Packer's book is Last Best Hope, America in Crisis and Renewal. It is out now. It's published by Jonathan Cape and Penguin Books. You've been listening to Intelligence Squared. I'm Justin Webb. Thank you for joining us.